Hello, and welcome to the Land Assess Due Diligence Tool Training. In today's training, you will learn how to implement the Land Assess Due Diligence Tool to evaluate land tenure risk and support responsible land-based investment that respects land rights across the company's supply chain. We'll begin by providing an introduction to the purpose and objectives of the tool, and we will discuss key issues and principles of responsible agricultural investment. We'll then look at the tool, the tool itself, and we'll explain its structure and intended use before walking through the implementation steps. Once we are all familiar with the tool, we'll walk through two exercises to demonstrate how the checklists work and how the tool creates reports to support management decision-making and institutional processes and policies that support responsible business practice. Our objectives for today's training are for participants to understand how the tool was developed and the results it is designed to support, how to adapt and implement the tool to fit the needs, issues, and challenges that your company is experiencing, who are the intended users of the tool, how, when, and where the tool should be used, how reports are generated and how they can be used in internal management processes and for external communication. And finally, we'll talk about the importance and role of local partners and collaborators and common internal capacity development needs that many companies experience. So first, we'd like to provide a bit of background on the land-related challenges, risks, and good practices that the tool is designed to address. Across the world, land rights issues are gaining attention. Increasingly, companies are under pressure to adopt policies and abide by higher standards of responsible practice to ensure that their operations are respecting the rights of communities and other affected land users. Respecting land rights is challenging for companies for a number of reasons. First, many companies are operating in national contexts in which the laws, policies, and regulations are inconsistent or contain gaps that render them inadequate to clarify and protect the rights of communities or other affected land users. Often, even where the formal laws are clear, weak or fragmented governance frameworks impede the implementation of these laws. In addition, the challenge of legacy land issues affect many large agricultural operations that may have been established through a government concession or expropriation, in many cases during a period of tumult or under a previous government, the history of the land, even where the transfer in question was many decades ago, and may even have been legal at the time, can pose ongoing land rights challenges for both companies and for communities. Many of these tenure contexts have land governance frameworks that include a mix of customary and formal rules. Adding to this complexity is the prevalence of informal rights, generally not recorded and often very difficult to ascertain with any certainty. Corruption and elite capture at the local and national levels, as well as coordination and information gaps among government agencies, company departments and staff members, community leaders and community members, all add to the challenges that companies face. These challenges are often at the root of a company's land issues and include issues with how the land was acquired in the first place, contested land rights, including long-standing disputes with communities or individuals claiming rights to all or part of a company's land are among the most common land-related issues cited by companies. Faulty legal license, uncertainty about the legality or legal standing of a company's rights, including clarity over boundaries and rights reserved or allocated to communities, for example, through an easement or a seasonal or temporary permitted use that is later interpreted by the communities or others as a perpetual right. A failure to acquire social license. Social license generally refers to a local community's acceptance or approval of a company's project or ongoing presence in an area. A weak or non-existent social license, meaning that the co communities reject the company's right to operate in the area, can have serious effects on a company's ability to operate. When such land issues arise, for example, when communities protest a company's right to expand on disputed land within the boundaries of an estate, they can lead to project delays, increases in costs, damage to a company's reputation, and ultimately can undermine or disable an investment. The overall message is that respecting land rights is both good practice and good business. One study found that ignoring communities' land rights can increase operational costs by up to 29 times. 
and can lead to the abandonment of an investment altogether. To avoid this, companies should adopt good land tenure practices. By recognizing and respecting tenure rights across their operations, proactively assessing and taking steps to mitigate or avoid negative impacts related to land use, monitoring and enforcing agreements, including boundaries and community benefit sharing arrangements, and establishing effective grievance mechanisms, ensuring that communities and affected individuals adequately participate in consultations and negotiations for land rights, as well as community programs, and incorporating food security and gender considerations and measures into their land risk analysis. These elements combine to support a company's social license to operate. The Land Assess tool was designed to help companies implement these key elements of good practice into their operations. The Commitment to Practice project was developed to support companies to fill, fulfill their commitments to better recognize and respect land rights throughout their supply chain. Although making such commitments is a critical first step towards achieving more responsible investments, many companies struggle with how to practically implement such commitments. From not understanding what questions to ask, to measure compliance with best practices, to not knowing what internal and external support they need to ensure that they have the capacity to meet those commitments. The Commitment to Practice Project and the resulting Land Assess tool work to assist companies to better understand and address land issues in their operations by providing companies guidance to adopt and integrate responsible practices into their operations, better identify and mitigate land rights risks, contribute to inclusive benefits and incomes for local communities, and help to reduce land-related conflicts where they operate. Our theory of change is that more effective land-related due diligence will support better processes and more relevant and accurate information gathering, which can in turn inform and improve company policies and decision-making so that companies are able to meet international standards for land rights. The result will be more equitable, more efficient, and more socially responsible land-based investments. Importantly, it is not just companies that are involved in this process, of understanding and addressing land issues related to an investment. Companies experience both external and internal pressures to adopt land procedures. They are under external pressure from the local, national, and global community to be more responsible and more ethical corporate actors. And they are motivated to understand and overcome disruptive and expensive challenges and manage risk to their productivity and efficiency. Civil society has an important role in understanding and supporting equitable investments by giving voice to community concerns, often acting as a conduit for information from communities to companies and government, and playing a strong role in advocating for community concerns and environmental issues. They also are often motivated by a desire to become or to be seen as an authority on land and community issues. Government also has an important part to play. In general, it works to encourage investment, to enforce laws, and to develop the economy, and is responsible for establishing and implementing a functional enabling framework for responsible investment. None of these actors can work in isolation. To be successful, companies, civil society, communities, and government must all work together to overcome land-related challenges and support responsible land-based investment. So with that background in mind, let's take a look at the Land Assess tool to understand what it is, what standards it is based on, and how you can use it to integrate land-related due diligence into your company's operations. The Land Assess tool is designed to help companies build capacity to address land issues by providing a clear and simple system for tracking and managing the process of recognizing and respecting land rights of smallholder farmers and communities where they operate. Landessa created the Land Assess tool based on the new Alliance for Food Security and Nutrition's analytical framework for land-based investments in African agriculture. The tool expands the reach of the analytical framework and applies to both new and existing operations, as well as to a range of business models. For example, large-scale estate land holdings, potential expansions or changes in the intensity of land use, and outgrower schemes. The tool is intended to be used by companies, civil society, and experts contracted to assist companies through their land compliance processes. 
So what is this tool? The tool is set up as a series of questions presented as checklists. These checklists deal with existing land, land that the company already uses, including land that a company may have held for many decades, as well as land that the company is considering acquiring. The tool covers both estate land or the company's own land, as well as land held by outgrowers that are part of the company's supply chain. The tool generates a report based on the answers to the questions in the checklist. This report highlights current or potential issues to inform the company's planning and management processes. These reports include a risk evaluation to guide prioritization and timing and guide the user to assign responsibility for task completion and monitoring. As I mentioned, we created the Land Assess tool based on the New Alliance Analytical Framework. The tool expands the reach of the analytical framework and applies to both new and existing operations and to a range of business models. Landessa worked closely with Ilovo Sugar Africa to pilot the tool in Ilovo's operations in Malawi, Mozambique, and Tanzania. Through this iterative design process, we field tested the tool and worked with company staff, local civil society organizations, and expert practitioners to refine the tool to improve user experience and support more effective integration of the tool results into a company's work planning. So now that we know how the tool came into being and what the problems are that the tool aims to address, let's take a look at the structure of the tool and how it should be integrated into your company's due diligence process. So the tool itself is an interactive Excel document containing a number of worksheets, as you can see here. The first tab contains instructions for completing the estate checklist. The second and third tabs are the estate checklist and the estate report. In tab four, you'll find the instructions for completing the outgrower checklist. And then tabs five and six contain the outgrower checklist and report respectively. We'll discuss each of these elements of the tool in detail as we go through the training. So the tool is broadly divided into two sections the estate section, and the outgrower section. For each section, the tool provides instructions, a checklist, and a report. These sections mirror each other and are structurally uh, quite similar with differing questions to address the particular issues that estates and outgrowers present. So checklists. Each checklist is a series of questions that the user will answer to carry out the assessment. These checklists are divided into sections, each containing a series of question rows. In each question row, there will be a drop-down cell in which the user, user will choose a status. This is the user's assessment of how completely or adequately the company has addressed the issue in question. Next, the question row contains a cell for the user to enter comments and documentation relevant to the question. Comments can provide important detail about the status assigned. For example, a comment can list an upcoming training session or legal proceeding that will impact the completion status for a particular checklist question. In the next column, the user can add comments or provide documentation. Documentation can be links to internal files or a description of the physical or electronic file location. And finally, each row includes a risk cell in which the user will assign a risk rating to the company's completion status for that question. The checklist is divided into sections to assess the company's risk. These sections include a corporate policy and capacity assessment, a legal, administrative, and institutional review, impact assessment, consultation and engagement, contracting and agreements, and grievances and feedback. A complete land-related due diligence process will include all of these sections. In addition, supplemental checklists are also provided to address issues related to encroachment and land use change, should those be pertin pertinent to a company's specific circumstances and operations. So the checklist provides a series of questions to assess whether the company has carried out specific actions demonstrating how well it's complied with the key elements of responsible land-based investment. Such questions include, for example, 
whether the company has adopted a land rights policy or whether it provided proper compensation to those whose land it obtained or is using. Instead of answering yes or no to each question, the user selects one of five options in the status column to indicate the amount of progress the company has made towards completing the action. The status ranges from minimally complete to some substantially complete. The ratings for the status assessment are less than 25% complete. This status indicates that the company has made minimal or no progress in the category. For example, for a question asking whether a company conducted an environmental and social impact assessment, the company identifies that it has not conducted such an assessment. So it's minimally complete in that status. The next status ranking is 26 to 50%. This status indicates that the company has made marginal pro progress in the category, but recognizes that there's work to be done. So for example, and the question about the ESIA, the company would identify that it has not conducted an assessment for many years, but it has concrete plans to conduct one in the near term. The next category of the status assessment is 51 to 75% complete. This status indicates that the company has made considerable progress in the category. So in the ESIA example, the company identifies that it has completed an ESIA. However, the assessment may not have comprehensively assessed social impacts. And so the company indicates that uh, continued work is required in that area. And the next category is 76 to 99% complete. This status indicates that the company has made substantial progress or is near completion of, a, of its objectives in the category. For example, in the ESIA case, the company has completed the ESIA and feels satisfied that it comprehensively addressed the social and environmental questions um, that it needed to address. It should be noted, however, that this ranking does not mean that future actions in the category will not be required. For example, an ESIA may be warranted in the future if the company's land rights or land uses change, um, or if it needs to update its assessment based on just time past. There's also a status ranking for not applicable. This status should be used sparingly and only if the category is clearly not applicable to a company's operations. For example, for a question asking whether domestic laws and policies governing outgrower schemes exist in the country where a com company operates, the user might mark the status NA if such laws do not exist. This status option should only be used if the category clearly does not apply to the context in which the company is operating. This option should not be used to avoid answering certain categories of questions. So that's the status assessment. In the third column, users have the option to provide comments and documentation to explain and support the status selected in the second column. This is a really important column that gives the user an opportunity to pr provide an explanation and more detail for why the company has not made considerable or substantial progress in a category in order to guide the company's efforts to better address an issue over the long term. For example, it may be the case that a company's land rights policies do not address the importance of women's land rights. However, a company could be in the process of consulting a gender expert to include such content. In this case, the company would include an explanation detailing its plans and a note to follow up and update the land assess tool once the action is complete. The tool also allows users to include links to documentation to support progress made in a category. For example, if a company indicates that it has a land rights policy and staff capacity to implement that policy, links to documents or other sources detailing the policy and work plans or reports pertaining to its implementation would be added in this column. In this way, the tool will serve as a single repository for information to support or explain a company's progress to date and can facilitate internal and external information sharing on the status of a company's land rights commitments. Finally, in the fourth column, users are, users are asked to assign a risk level of one to three, with one meaning low risk, two meaning medium risk, and three meaning high risk. In assigning a risk level, 
we are evaluating how significant each risk is in terms of our overall objectives. These objectives include respecting land rights and avoiding harm to women and men farmers, efficiently and cost effectively ensuring agricultural production by avoiding disruption and delays caused by land conflict, avoiding damage to social license or reputation locally or globally, complying with best practices and company policies, avoiding conflict. These are all important objectives for a land rights uh, effort for, by a company. And in evaluating risk, it's important to note that status and risk will not necessarily correlate. For example, a company could make significant progress toward mapping areas of past, current, and emerging encroachment. However, the issue of encroachment could still be prevalent and ongoing. Therefore, the user would want to assign a higher level of risk to reflect the fact that the category still poses a risk to the company in spite of the substantial progress the company has made in fulfilling the status completion part of that checklist. By assigning a risk value, the tool helps the user to prioritize risk and follow on actions according to the significance and probability of potential impact. To be most effective when assigning a risk rating, the user should assign the rating for the highest potential consequence anticipated. Once each checklist is completed, the tool will automatically generate a report on the next tab. The report will include all the questions with a completion status of less than 51% or a risk rating of two or higher. This highlights areas where a company has made moderate, minimal, or no progress, as well as areas that pose heightened risk to companies, farmers, and communities, and shows how and where a company should prioritize its efforts. The report will be automatically populated with the checklist question, the section the question came from, the status, and risk. The user will then define required follow-up follow -up actions, internal and external capacity required to take up those actions, and a realistic timeline for completing the actions listed. Good practice and our experience field testing the tool provide some important insights for First, assessment should involve the affected communities. The process of implementing the tool can be an important community engagement and communication opportunity, offering a demonstration of the company's goodwill and the seriousness of its commitment to responsible investment. Second, land tenure assessments must go beyond the immediate obvious impact of land transfer to identify a company's current and potential impacts on livelihoods, on food security, and related rights and social issues. Actively seeking to identify gender impacts and issues is both good practice and supports more effective outcomes for companies. The assessment is an important means for identifying potential business impacts of a land-related change and to develop appropriate mitigation measures. Importantly, the assessment should take place before a contract for the potential change in land use or control has been concluded. To ensure that the assessments reach across the company's supply chain, they should be carried out for all suppliers as well. Improving community relations and fostering trust and open communication with communities can help to limit costly conflict and misunderstanding. Sharing the outcome of assessments can be a useful way to improve communication and develop solutions that reflect both company and community priorities. Each company will have its own way of implementing the tool according to its size, structure, supply chain, and internal processes. In general, companies should begin by training company staff and leadership about land-related standards and the importance of land rights to the company's operation and mission. Equally important is clearly designing responsibility for implementing the assessment and using the results to guide policies and mitigation actions. Where this will reside within a company will vary from company to company. Some key factors that a company should use to guide this decision include access to information. The Land Assess Tool Implementer will require access to a wide range of information about the company's land holdings, legal matters, including production contracts, lease agreements, legal disputes, and other issues, production processes, 
and a human, re human resources policies, to name just a few. The successful and timely implementation of the LandSS tool will therefore require sufficient access to company-wide information. Second, the management authority and decision-making of the implementer is important. The tool implementer should have sufficient authority to make recommendations for needed actions and strategic responses to ensure that the land assess tool and resulting reports are integrated into company processes and procedures. Third, important core competencies for the implementer or implementing team include legal and policy compliance, grievance processes, community relations, and management processes. Due to the range of competencies, a company should likely assign more than one of individual to be responsible for implementation. Establishing and streamlining internal processes, gathering data, and building capacity so that company staff can effectively implement the tool are important steps. But no company working on its own can address all the relevant land issues around an investment. To be successful, a company must systematically and consistently engage with communities, government, stakeholders, and civil society. Understanding engagement and communication as a necessary element of doing business and incorporating strategies and processes into it systems accordingly is imperative. So once a company has undertaken the assessment, the results should shape the company's policies and decision-making for land use or expansion, should inform capacity development needs, should guide how it sources commodities to ensure a socially responsible supply chain, and should lead the way to developing improved strategies and procedures related to land, community engagement, grievance mechanisms, et cetera. The assessment results should be shared internally as well as externally. To the extent feasible, the assessment report can be used to communicate with communities and government and global stakeholders about a company's journey towards responsible land investment. So how can a company ensure success in implementing the tool? Each company is different from the size of its operations to the individuals involved and trained to deal with land issues, to the management structure, operational context, et cetera. Some questions that will be important as you and your team work to implement the tool include, what company departments need to be involved in implementation? How will the results be used to direct company policies and activities? What else is going on within the company that this process should streamline with or at least inform? What support or information from external stakeholders will you need? Are there local organizations or actors who can help with community outreach or guide you to better understand tenure dynamics? What challenges within the company or in the local context do you foresee? Thinking through these questions will help to set you up for a smoother, more effective tool implementation process. Okay, now that we have discussed the background, use, design, and best practices for implementing the land assess tool, let's look at the tool itself. So here we have the tool. Just noting that, again, we see there are instructions for the estate checklist, checklist itself, the estate report, and then instructions for the outgrow checklist, the outgrow checklist, and the outgrow report. So the user uses the tabs at the bottom of the Excel file to toggle between these different uh, sections of the tool. So here on the estate checklist, the first column, we see the checklist questions. This contains all the questions that make up the checklist. The second column is a drop-down menu where the user can select the completion status for the question. In the next column, the user can include comments that provide detail or nuance related to the question at hand, as well as documentation to substantiate the status completion assessment. And finally, the last column is the risk assessment column, where the user uses a drop-down menu to select a risk rating of one to three, with one being low, ri low risk and three being the highest risk. Okay, so let's, let's have a look at the corporate policy and capacity assessment part of the tool. 
This section evaluates whether and how well a company has adopted and implemented policies related to land rights, as well as its capacity to carry out the land tenure assessment and any actions that might be required to address or mitigate suboptimal findings. So let's walk through the process of filling out the checklist. Here we have question 1.1.1 under policy assessment. This question asks, does the company have a policy related to responsible land-based investment? The user can then select from the drop-down menu to assign a completion level and add comments and documentation. So how would a user answer this question? If a company does not have any policy in place that mentions land or responsible investment practices, the user would select less than 25% complete. This indicates little or no pro progress made towards completion. The user would then add a comment to explain what if any efforts are underway to develop the policy. No progress made, for example. If a company has a draft policy in place and is working through the process of formalizing and institutionalizing the policy, the user might still select a rating of less than 25% complete. But importantly, in the comments section, this would, this would be where the user would indicate um, draft three of the policy under review by exec committee. Um, date of adoption proposed for April 30, 2020. Okay, so this simply provides information about why the status is selected as it was, less than 25% complete, and what's going on within the company so that when reviewing the report, whoever's in charge of making sure things are moving along can understand what's happening with this process. Documentation for this might be the draft policy itself, a link to the document, or an agenda for the next meeting, um, or any, any other relevant internal document like that. If a company has a policy in place that comprehensively addresses the elements of responsible land-based investment, the user might select more than 75% complete. This indicates that the company has made substantial progress in the area and follow-up actions required probably would not warrant top priority for the near term. So the user might say, policy adopted on the date. Um, and um, would indicate where the, the file location is for that final policy. For the risk rating, the user might assign risks based on their understanding of how, how the quality of the policy or how distant the company might be from adopting a policy. So we know that having a policy in place is an important first step in ensuring compliance with best practices and respecting land rights. And that not having such a policy often corresponds to a higher incidence of land related issues and problems. So we can assign a high risk level, a three out of three, to the scenario where there's no policy in place. So you see a high risk level turns it red, uh, a lot, as well as a lo low status completion level. That indicates red flag. So where there's a policy in place, but it is incomplete or lacks specificity or fails to adopt clear standards, the user may still assign a high risk level to indicate that addressing this policy issue is a high priority for the company. So the questions that follow in this section help the user to further evaluate how well the policy is being implemented, if it exists, and whether it meets accepted standards and best practices. So for example, does the co company have a policy relating to women's rights, including women's rights to land? If so, has that policy been implemented or does it have a plan in place for implementing the policy, um, et cetera, et cetera. So that's how the corporate policy and capacity assessment section will work. Moving down to the next section, capacity assessment section. So let's look at question 1.2.2. This question asks, does the company have the necessary expertise to conduct land tenure impact assessments 
and ESIAs that include assessing human rights and food security impacts? Does the company also have the capacity to develop a plan for how to avoid or mitigate these impacts? Many companies lack in-house expertise on social issues, land tenure dynamics, and other issues such as food security impacts. While many companies have experience with ESIAs as required under domestic laws, these domestic requirements often do not include food security concerns, land tenure concerns, or social issues. So for this reason, it's important to highlight, highlight that these issues are critical to the success or the relevance of a land tenure impact assessment, uh, and so are central to a company's capacity assessment exercise. So to answer this question, the user will need to understand and think carefully about what ESIAs and land tenure impact assessments entail in order to determine whether the necessary knowledge and techniques exist in-house. So for this question, let's say that the company has a community liaison officer who is regularly in contact with communities and affected farmers. This officer was trained in communications and has a background in land tenure. So for a large estate, this person would contribute to a land tenure impact assessment, but due to the scale of the assessment, wouldn't be able to complete the assessment without help. So the user might assign a completion status of 26 to 50% to indicate that there is some capacity within the company, but that additional resources are needed to do a full assessment. In the comment cell, the user would indicate one officer on staff, the state community liaison, and that more, more support is required, more support needed. So how do we assign the risk then? The risk is pretty high. If management does not allocate the additional resources required and instead assigns the lone community liaison officer the task of conducting the full assessment, it's unlikely to be comprehensive or to set a strong foundation for the company's land-related efforts. So in this scenario, we would assign a risk level of two or even three. So let's look at question 1.2.6. This question asks, do relevant staff have sufficient authority and institutional support to carry out their duties relating to land? For example, job descriptions list duties and are linked to performance reviews. So this is an important part of capacity that is often overlooked, ensuring that the staff tasked with dealing with land issues have clear duties and lines of responsibility, and that internal incentives and quality control measures are in place to ensure that land issues are dealt with according to the company policies and procedures. We've seen many examples of companies that adopt sound policies and actually quite ambitious land-related policies, but then fail to ensure that these policies will be enacted and implemented because they don't establish institutional controls and processes to enable the policy to be implemented. So here, if the company has developed job descriptions, has thought through where within the company the land personnel will work and how they will communicate internally to report and address land concerns, the user might assign a completion status of greater than 75%. We have a policy, we have the processes, this company is ready to go. So the documentation would include job descriptions, training material, or the relevant section of the employee handbook. So this would be a link to the handbook, for example, in the internal server or wherever the documents are held. So what about risk for this one? The, the user might consider a lack of capacity to carry out land-related activities and actions as a major risk to the company's ability to meet its land commitments, yet having recognized that that's important, the company has gone through the steps of developing these processes. So good job, the company assigns a risk level of one and no, no further action is required at this time. Okay, so let's look now to section three of the estate checklist. So section three is impact assessments. All the checklists are important, 
but the impact assessments checklist really lays the foundation for a company to understand its land tenure issues so it can begin to develop improved strategies and practices around land. Note that these questions may apply to a past acquisition or to a prospective or ongoing acquisition, as we've discussed. So for these past acquisitions, a user may have to dig around a bit to learn the circumstances and processes that took place a long time ago. So let's have a look at some of these questions. The first question is, how did the company acquire rights to its current holding? So the, the intent of this question is to assess sort of the tenure risk related to the original acquisition. So where, while it, it doesn't call for a, a yes or no answer, really the, the question is asking, how risky was it? So we know that less than 25% completion is high risk, um, going all the way up to greater than 75%, not a, not a concern. So say, for example, the company recently acquired a parcel of land and in, in this acquisition went through several steps, first meeting with government and local actors to understand who the local landholders were and then undergoing consultations and through a back and forth process, negotiated the terms of a lease arrangement um, in which all affected land rights holders were consulted and gave consent. Um, and at the end of which there's a signed lease that the local community has on file and that the company has sent on to government. So they've gone through all the processes and it was a comprehensive um, process that respected land rights. In such a situation, the company, the user would select greater than 75% complete. In the comments and documentation section, the user would want to either indicate a report that summarizes the processes and also add a link to the lease itself and any other relevant documents. And in the risk assessment, this is where the user can say, we don't think there's a risk as to whether we have rights to this holding. It's not an issue of concern, so I'm gonna assign a risk level of one. So that's how, how you might go through that process. The second question asks, did the land transfer involve government expropriation and involuntary displacement? Well, in the first scenario, we didn't describe that. That, that didn't happen, so you would, you would select actually not applicable. No government involvement, no involuntary displacement. So what about for an, an older acquisition? So say in the first example, uh, this is a piece of land that the estate acquired in the 1960s. And we don't really know the process very well because it was a prior company that even, that was in place that acquired the land at that time. There might, there might even have been uh, litigation or community protest uh, in the intervening years over the land boundaries or different rights associated with this holding. So in that situation, the user might select 26 to 50 percent to indicate yes we have a lease we know we have a lease and yet there might have been some issues with it because of the nature of the government or the nature of the acquisition at the time in this in this section the user would then relate those issues in the comments and provide any documentation this would carry a pretty high risk as we've mentioned um, legacy land issues can be quite disruptive to companies um, for a number of reasons. So in this situation, we might select a different assessment did the, for the question, did the land transfer involve government expropriation and involuntary displacement? Well, did it involve government expropriation? No, but was there involuntary displacement? Yes, there was, okay. So that carries at least 51 to 75% um, rating because there was there were issues involved with the land transfer. Those issues would be described here. Um, neighboring community displaced, and you might even describe the conditions of that displacement, or uh, again link to a report. 
describing the situation. And again, we would assign a risk level of two or three, depending on whether that issue has been laid to rest and adequately dealt with um, or what the current status is. Moving along, we see question three, did the company map all land rights holders and users affected by the land transfer? So for many companies, um, though there's an external boundary, there was not a comprehensive mapping of all the, the affected land rights holders and users. Uh, so while there is an external boundary mapping exercise, uh, in general, a company might find that they have not satisfied this category and would indicate the, the situation by saying external boundaries map, um, individual users, individual users not mapped, or some such comment, and then provide a link to the mapping boundary. Um, and perhaps they've already identified this as an issue, uh, and they might say uh, land rights mapping planned for date, for the date of the plan. So we know this is an issue. Uh, management's already decided that we're going to do some land rights mapping. We're going to do it on this date. Failure to adequately identify uh, affected land rights holders carries a large risk, and so this would carry a risk rating of three. So this is how a user will go through and answer the questions, describe the answer uh, with more detail, and then provide a risk rating. But as you can see, it, it's a subjective exercise, clearly, uh, and one that the user should take care to take on board any external help or assistance in evaluating how well have we really done this. In some cases, a user might find that he or she doesn't have the necessary expertise to even evaluate how well did we do engagement or whose legitimate land rights are we even talking about. So it's important to remember that in going through the assessment process, the company might need additional capacity or assistance from experts in these sorts of issues. So that's the general idea. Noting again that the outgrower checklist has instructions for the outgrower checklist as well as the checklist itself. And as you can see, it's quite similar to the estate checklist. Okay, it deals with policies, legal, administrative, and institutional review, impact assessments, consultation and engagement, et cetera. So it has the same categories and subsections of the checklist, but the questions are tailored to the particular context of outgrowers. Okay. So that's, that's the overview of how we'll use the checklist. And next, we'll turn to how we use the final tool. Okay. So now that we've gone through the checklist, Let's have a look at a report and talk through what appears automatically in the report, as well as what a user will add to the report and how the report can then be integrated into a company's management processes. So here we have an estate follow-up report. And this is a sample again that we created just for the purposes of the training based on a fictional company. This sample report has been completed for section three, dealing with impact assessments. So the report highlights the main issue, issues of concern and shows only those checklist items with a completion status of less than 50% or a risk rating of two or higher. So you can see the report contains a column that lists all the checklist questions. So for example, here we have question 3.1.3, .3, did the company map all land rights holders and users affected by the land transfer? In the next column, this shows which section of the checklist the question originated in so that anyone looking at the report can see that this question came from the impact assessment section. So in a full report, you would have a number of different sections and you could then sort by the section so that you could target specific parts of the tool in order to understand in your report analysis what has to happen next. Then we see the completion status that was assigned to the question. So here, 
company has done little to no land rights mapping in relation to the land transfer in question. So they got a minimally complete status, a negative, uh, less than 25%. And finally, the risk, the risk assessment assigned to that question. So here the user has assigned the status a risk of two. It's a potentially significant risk given both the importance of recognizing land rights of affected individuals and the potential for conflict that arises out of contested land rights in combination with the minimal completion status assigned. So that's a risk of two. So these first four columns will automatically be populated in the report. So you can see all these questions have been automatically populated. Next, the user will determine what appropriate follow-up actions are needed to mitigate, remediate, and address the issue. So here, for example, where the company did not map all the land rights holders and users affected by the transfer, the user might write community engagement and land rights mapping is the next required step. Okay, another step might, might be um, engage a consultant to advise. So in this, in some situations, the company just might not know what the next step is to do, and it's a perfectly legitimate follow-up action to request assistance to come up with the next steps. So in this column, the user will indicate the follow-up actions required. In the next column, the user then establishes who's going to be responsible for taking up these follow-up actions. So here, internally, there might be a land officer who could take responsibility for carrying out a land rights mapping or engaging a consultant to advise. Externally, there might be a consultant, as we talked about, or some other local expert on land tenure. Um, company thinks that it can carry out the action without external help, you would, might, you would put none or not ap applicable. So importantly, a timeline column is the last part of the, of the report exercise. And this timeline is where the user indicates when this task will be initiated or completed. So here the land officer might be responsible internally and might say, okay, in order to meet our targets, we have to complete the land rights mapping exercise by the end of quarter three. Um, so that's how the user will go through and fill, fulfill the rest of the report in order to start to plan how to carry out the necessary follow-up actions and integrate those actions into the company's processes. So going through the rest, you can see how it works. You can see that the status, the status completion with less than 25% complete gets a red or a pink color. Um, the second category, 26 to 50%, gets orange. And that these, that's to help the user have a visual for how risky, how important are these issues. Um, and then likewise with the risk rating, high rating of three gets red, two gets the yellow, and one gets the green. So the end result, will be a full report outlining what issues must be taken to address the flagged issues, how the issues should be addressed, who will do it, and when. The report can then be used to check on completion and to ensure accountability for the required actions as the company seeks to address land throughout its supply chain. So the first assessment and resulting report that the company undertakes will provide a framework for integrating appropriate processes and actions into the management plans and day-to-day -day operations of the company. The tools should be re-administered periodically to ensure that these processes are working well and are being implemented effectively. Integrating socially responsible land investment practices into a company's policies and activities is a long-term commitment. So congratulations on taking the first step to developing and implementing your company's land-based due diligence processes. Thank you and good luck.